Yes, sir. It's Halloween. Alistair Crowley. Like an undead Keith Harris heaving himself out of the grave, we're back for another fright bag. And what everyone's searching for this time of year is that perfect, evocative Halloween atmosphere. Look no further then than 1989's Dracula Live from Transylvania, a television event hosted by George Hamilton, hired off playing the Count a decade earlier in Love at First Bite. Dracula. We'll walk where the real Dracula walked. Meet men and women who have followed in his blood-sucking footsteps. It's that familiar, historically questionable premise of Dracula being interchangeable with Vlad the Impaler in a 90-minute show essentially consisting of George stumbling round Vlad's castle making jokes about his own tan. I'd hate to have been invited to one of his dinner parties. RSVP or else? Whatever you do, don't ask for a steak. Absolutely 10 out of 10 for gothic atmosphere. It's a night of beautifully spooky locales, all dark alcoves and flickering candles, perpetually illuminated by a flash of lightning. Yoo-hoo! Anybody home? In a classic Universal Monsters opening, George is warned off by sinister locals. You don't want to go there at night, alone. no more. Interwoven with interviews and video packages about Vlad and Bram Stoker is a running storyline for which we need to change the phrase Campus Christmas to Campus Halloween. Since I was a little girl, I have heard terrible things about the man who lives inside. He said that Dracula lives there. Enough! But in all the talk of blood drinking and corpses on pikes, the show's most baffling aspect is its completely unnecessary liveness. The live aspect of a special usually suggests an element of danger or discovery. Unless someone's going to get attacked by a vampire for real, there's no need for it. And the fact that, for its American cast and crew, it's four in the morning when the final credits roll just increases the many technical errors and awkward pauses. Quiet. Then Dracula was for real, huh? On top of this, an extra layer, a fake show within a show, putting scripted bloopers alongside the real ones. You're on live now? Uh, uh hello everybody, I'm, I'm, uh, George Hamilton. We're, uh, Dracula is the Prince of Darkness, a specter who haunts our nightmares. Interviews are conducted by Hamilton in character as a nervous version of himself. Interviews where exhausted academics recite great reams of scripted answers. Welcome, I am Radu Florescu. Claiming himself a descendant of the real Dracula, Radu looks and speaks like someone mashed together every serial killer. George, look yonder. Here's the blue Danube, which has divided nations in the past and reunited them in Dracula's time. Maybe I'll see you later. Well, I also have some research up the castle, but perhaps we can have you for dinner. I'm not afraid of Dracula, but I'm terrified of Radu. Less scary is Bernard Davis, chairman of the Dracula Society. An historical group dedicated to learning the truth about how Dracula was born. Is that correct? Yeah. And incidentally, there's a lot of humour in Dracula. Yeah, like the times the Prince of the Undead says he's off to make my toilet. For example, the uh, predicament of the Count at the beginning, where he's stuck in that drafty castle with three nagging wives, having to do all the cooking and washing up himself. Every comment my patrons leave under the latest essay about Bobby Davro. Well, he must have been writing it in a white-hot fever of sexual frustration. But what of Stoker? Was he just Tommy tanking all day? Anyway, why should a manager of a theatre full of ambitious young actresses need to be frustrated? It beats me. <laughs> all right, Harvey Weinstein. They cover how the original Dracula manuscript was discovered in a barn decades later, but don't mention the lost foreword, 
Wes Stoker said it was a true story which happened to some friends of his, changing only their names for privacy's sake. That's not a joke. There was a Time magazine article about it. Dracula happened. But it's 3am and you're not an actor, on live TV having to remember a load of dialogue. What's more, Stoker used often real news events, such as the, the wreck of a real Russian schooner, to make the book more effective. He often used uh, real events, and uh, like the wreck of a real Russian schooner, for example. That's Bernard's bottle gone. This is how their scene ends, looking down as it cuts to a VT. That might be just the place. But wind back a couple of minutes, Bernard accidentally does the finish early, then suddenly realises there's one more bit. They tell us quite a bit about uh, his, um, his methods of research and the sources of his material. Really? Oh, chiefly though. George is great value, with looks to camera, frightened reactions, and holding it together in classic derisive host style, with digs about how shite the show is. Wait, I get a hold of my agent, I'll put a stake in his heart. Violent Proustian rushes back to the newsagent Halloween tat I spent all my pocket money on. If a child is born malformed, it's thought that the vampires caused it. This isn't just history though, it's happening now. And a folklore expert fills us in on real vampires. Who are you? Noreen Dresser. Because they can be flight attendants, they can be hospital workers, teachers. Teachers? Hold on a sec. Pam stabbed one of Brad's fingers with a sterilized hypodermic needle of the type normally used for animals. After spending about 20 minutes stabbing Brad's fingers and then sucking them... In 1989? She can't have seen this. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. So don't die of ignorance. The vampires join them on set, albeit disguised to protect their identities. Hi Brad, it's good to see you. You know, you've told me that you're a donor. That means you give blood to vampires? I did. Well, I met, an, I met a woman who, uh, in, to, in all other respects, seemed to be uh, functioning, married, had a full-time job. And Monique, it's nice to have you here. Um, do you consider yourself a vampire? Yes, I do. How much blood do your modern vampires drink? Oh, I'd say about half a glass. Oh, that much. I've quaffed more Sillet Bang than that by accident. Well, thank you both very much. Radu has a scripted argument with another Drac professor. Came back to Vlad. Just what was his problem anyway? I mean, as a little boy, he must have been on the wrong side of Santa's naughty and nice list. <laughs> he was a victim of circumstance. He saw his father killed, his brother sodomized, another brother buried alive. You have Keep it light. <laughs> Old bat. <laughs> no, I was just examining this rogues gallery. A virtual who's who of blood killers. He's not wrong. And uh, he, after shooting them, he'd drain their blood into a glass, drink it down. Then he'd dispose of their body in a little sulfuric acid. <laughs> Meanwhile, the running storyline finds a murderer to questionably portrayed Gypsy Camp. Yes, there is not a drop of blood in his body. Next he's gonna say, look, on his neck, teeth marks. I've seen it all before. George and the beautiful gypsy woman a third his age he's been hitting on all night realise the real Dracula's in his coffin at the castle and they need to destroy him. But after a historian gets murked, George makes a run for it with a gag about how he may molest the much younger woman. Wait for me at the carriage, you'll be safe there. Okay. Air Transylvania, right? Peasant class? Leaves in one hour. The last flight for three weeks? I'm out of here. Mr. Hamilton forgot his coat. 
Thank God George escaped. But oh no, sexy gypsy lady. Ow! That's the perils of live TV. And what a Halloween night this was. Looking for more chills and thrills? Tune in for Freddy's Nightmares, followed by Friday the 13th, the series. In seeking out that perfect atmosphere, there's no period like the 1970s. The hauntological homeland, I got the tail end of it in my 80s childhood. From Osborne books to Brooke Bond's unexplained mystery cards, when photos were grainy and sinister, UFOs were filled with multitude races of weird goblins and gorgeous blondes, and anything might be real. Then in the late 80s, Whitley Stryber came along with a book cover which flattened ufology to that one generic grey alien and its mates being covered up by the government. Boring. Take me back to the days of Arthur C. Clarke and Leonard Nimoy. To that ghostly old man in the back of the car. Well, we can go there, with a 1977 documentary titled Out of This World. I mean, old UFO heads know this picture better than their own faces. Everything's told in the news-like style of the time. No flashy graphics or sneering narrator letting everyone know they're tongue-in-cheek about this nonsense. Today, this would be hosted by someone off Love Island going, Take me to your leader, bruv. This film was taken by an amateur photographer in Montana in 1950. Then, at nine o'clock on the morning in 1973, a building surveyor, Peter Day, filmed this red ball in Buckinghamshire from his stationary car. The meat of this doc is the brilliantly 70s, brilliantly British eyewitness reports, opening on some lads aiming UFO detectors into the sky. You know, they use the clouds of cover and you see the crafty sounds as they, they just hide there. Yeah. Imagine Alan Bennett wrote a letter to the Fortean Times. It was in August 19, 1961, about 11 o'clock one night, and uh, I was waiting for a train at Parsons Green Station. Did you begin to suspect it... it's not a plane? I had my suspicions, put it that way, but I couldn't yeah. prove anything. I'll be damned, it's a blinking flying saucer. It was the... identical with the thing that George Adamski saw. We also get the origin story of George King, founder of UFO religion, the Aetherius Society, who was informed one day while driving a taxi by an alien that he'd lead an interplanetary government. I mean, I opened my eyes and he was there. Uh, he was very tall. He was dressed in a long robe. Uh, he had long brownish hair, light brownish hair and uh, I knew although he didn't tell me but I knew that he was um, Jesus and I knew that he'd come from the planet Venus and he just moved to one side into the green beam and was gone. George and co believe in stockpiling prayers to be released in supercharged dumps during times of crisis. Now we're here today to use our mantra and prayer to charge up a prayer power battery. At the moment, this battery has uh, almost 600 hours of prayer energy in it. About 10 minutes of play if you stick it in a Game Gear. Blessed are the wise ones, for they walk through a dark and ignorant world spreading their light. Blessed are the wise ones, for they walk through a dark and ignorant world, spreading their light. The Aetherians are still going strong today, and Sean Ryder sat in on one of their sessions for another documentary. Not sure what it says about these alien gods, Choosing an emissary who tucks his trousers into his socks. We also hear from a man who got sucked up by a spacecraft. 
And you, Arthur Shuttlewood, are famous, or to some people notorious. But I wasn't frightened. I just teetered in midair, if you like, several feet up, obviously. And an expert who runs a UFO magazine. Are they some sort of attempt to control human beings? Do they select simple people for this purpose? Simple people? And this time it came right close up to his tractor. We also have many alarming cases, alarming because we don't know the implications of them, of blood being taken from people and also semen. Sorry, where are these UFOs found usually? And a person came through and it was a female. And this one was completely naked, according to his testimony. And, well, eventually he, he, he had feel so, felt so relaxed that the inevitable took place at her urging, apparently. Let me know, yeah? But offer me a hundred Whitley Strybers. A thousand former government officials talking about secret pacts with the Greys. Disclosure coming any day now. And I wouldn't take them over this farmer's wife. I heard this terrific noise. It was just like a giant cauldron of water being poured onto a, a fire. And I uh, slipped my jumper on and went outside to find my two sons lying flat on the ground in the garden in front of the house, shouting, Mummy, Mummy, there's a flying saucer. Automatically looked up to see this, all I can describe, this huge Mexican hat. Wait a second. Enormous Mexican hat. Double wait a second. There were two people in there. Um, these people were beautiful people. That's the only way I can des describe them. Um, they had long golden hair, like a page, bo page boy bob, just like the old kings. They had beautiful faces. I shall never forget their faces as long as I live. It, whatever they had round their heads, which was like a transparent fishbowl. The next tale opens with just about the most 1970s England sentence ever spoken. One November evening last year, Mrs Bowles and a friend of the family, Mr Pratt, were driving out of Winchester when they saw a light in the sky. This is where we see the large orange light. Mm -hmm. Then it disappeared and I am coming up to it now. It appeared again here. But it started harbouring down below the back of these trees in the hedges here. It's a bad bend, isn't it? The light made their car go mad and start accelerating towards a hedge. So I grabbed the steering wheel as Mrs. Bowles was fighting with it, and suddenly the car straightened itself. That was when we see... Well, then the... Sorry, yes. That was when we see, what I shall say, a cigar-shaped object hovering in front of us. Cigars, Mexican hats, see? Old UFOs were way more interesting. Inside were three figures. Then I see one of these figures get out of this thing, this yeah. object, and yeah. it started walking across towards me. Yes. yes, we're all having a giggle, but do these people not seem sincere? Matter of fact, these are outlandish stories, but it's impossible not to believe them. He had pink eyes which were very piercing. He had sideboards and a beard which met. I see a movement of this figure. Oh, by the way, I grabbed Ted and I just literally wrapped my body round Ted. Well, this definitely isn't something made up to Mr. Bowles in a panic after someone spotted her parked in a lay-by wrapped around Mr. Pratt. Since this happening, I have had a telephone call from a person from London telling me on no account am I to say anything to anyone about this, what we've seen, because I should be having a government official come round to see me. And after all, this is England and this is a free country and I will speak and say what I want, which is the truth. Good on you, girl. For the last word, let's return to the prof, who's an early proponent of the ultra-dimensional theory. Reality stacked on realities. Surrounding us now in this room. Yes. I might be sticking my finger through many worlds. Oi, watch where you're putting that. Of all the places you'd expect to have a Halloween special, perhaps dead last would be CITV, 
as with this 1997 art attack. But be wary, this one promises to be spooky. Scariest thing might be the mid-90s CG Prit stick. This is my spooky art attack! There's a tweet that often goes round asking what's a childhood story which perfectly encapsulates you now as an adult. For me it's deliberately skipping my first school trip so I could instead turn my home into a haunted house, making cobwebs out of cotton wool and transforming the cupboard under the stairs into a mad scientist's lab via beakers cut out of paper. The set design here is pretty much what the five-year-old me was going for. <laughs> nice big bowl of comb. Dip it in there, lad. Give him a big commy nose. Spunkenstein, more lad. It's alive with comb. This way, master. When the judge asks me, are you doodling over there while well, I'm in the jury at a murder trial? How big a line of beak is that? Don't be stupid, boy. It's garlic powder for Neil's trademark big picture. I had hoped for a massive Jeffrey Dahmer out of eviscerated organs, but let's see what he's up to. This show's really not like I remember. I mean... Here's a good tip. Make it drip. Make it go all droopy and floppy, all dripping off. Look at that, big chunks of it dripping down. That looks really horrible, doesn't it? Let's see. Ectoplasm gunk. Spooky, huh? I'll see you next time. If there is a next time. <laughs> but it wasn't just Neil. Even the Sooty Show celebrated our most glorious festival in an October 1988 episode titled The Unreal Ghostbusters. Whoa, I am the ghost of Matthew's bedroom. I'm here to haunt him forever and forever. Well, certainly until the sheets have got to go back to the laundry, that's a... <laughs> look at your faces. You look as if you see the ghost. The gang are freaking each other out with Matthew's book of scary stories. Bumped into old Millard the other day. Oh yeah, how was he? It was nauseating. It was a life form but without intelligence. It was a sickening blob. As everyone brags they aren't afraid of ghosts, they start hearing a strange noise coming from inside a cupboard. That's not Pipes' glory hole, is it? Oh no, it's just Sue doing the hoovering. I'm sorry to... Oops. They dare big brave Matthew to stay in a haunted hotel room in a remake of that Stephen King film. What if I, uh, what if I don't manage to stay the night? Hmm? What then? I have to treat you to a slap up fish and chip supper? Yes! <laughs> but to get their chippy tea, the animals have sneakily booked to stay themselves to mess with him. I guess they have working credit cards? Poor Matthews pranked with classic Scooby-Doo style antics, ropes and winches, paintings whose eyes follow you round the room. Right, Sooty, you pull the rope and we'll see how brave Matthew is. <laughs> I love it! Take it into your lungs and feel it in there! I love it, don't you? Yeah! <laughs> I always forget Sooty's a powerful sorcerer capable of manifesting spirits. Come on, take the sheet off, take it off, let's see what you really look like. You don't frighten me, take it off now. <laughs> Did they ever nail down Sooty's power level? Could he beat Doctor Strange in top trumps? Matthew must be in permanent fear of his life, like that Twilight Zone with the evil kid. What's that, Sooty? Read you another story or you'll make me poo a football. Well, did you all enjoy your fish and chip supper? Oh, yes, thank you, Matthew. But the main point of interest here is Matthew's song to assuage frightened young viewers. The next time some ghost hunter goes, What was that? into a night vision camera, sing them this. 
Things that go bump in the night needn't frighten you. Don't be alarmed, little girls, little boys. There's always a reason, a way to explain it. Something quite simple is making that noise. It could be a door being blown by the breeze. It could be the plumbing that happens sometimes. It isn't ghosts or goblins, of that I am sure. There's nobody waiting just behind the door. Get that out of your mind, get that out of your head. Sooty's hotel stomp was pretty good, but we can't discuss spooky pranks without Beadle. When he wasn't digging up people's front lawns or making them think their van had gone in the river, Big Jez occasionally ventured into horror-based japes, like early risers at a cryogenics lab. People have to make. Like go away. <laughs> Shall we bring him out again? Good. Yeah, Enter Beetle. Could you shoot? Oh, God, you f Probably best remembered, other than the infamous alien, is the old, you're temping at a blood bank, but your boss is Dracula. <laughs> White Caucasian. Enter Count Bidula! <laughs> but these all pale next to the greatest Halloween prank of all time. A perennial favourite for me, which I'll listen to every year, like how people watch It's a Wonderful Life at Christmas. A live broadcast from the American Forces radio network at midnight on Halloween 1952. Three reporters were dispatched to the real Castle Frankenstein, which isn't a thing, where they were told the monster returns home once a century. This very night! Armed with just a walkie-talkie and a torch, Carl Nelson was sent down to the family crypt under the castle. We actually see nothing as yet, as our eyes have not become accustomed to the darkness, as this little flashlight does not throw out very much light. At one point, a hiding producer pulls something over with a piece of string. We have knocked over something here that... Oh. Excuse me, just one second, but... What... Seems like this is some type of a... Some type of a... Mache, maybe something that... Also down there is a life-sized statue of the monster. The gas, but we, our light is fading and it's on something that looks like a statue. Yes, it is just a statue, but a, an ungodly statue or is a horrible looking statue, much like the monster, perhaps something put here years ago, maybe the original mold, but we don't believe in these things, and we're going to walk up and touch this to see perhaps what it could be made of. Unlike poor Carl, you can probably guess where this is going. No, it, it couldn't. It, it seemed to move as we came up upon it. No, this is ridiculous. Not wax. I'm getting out of here. Please, God, no. Help! Help! Please help! Please! Can't you hear? Can't you hear me out there? No! No! No!
the reason Cole goes quiet here is because, on being unable to open the locked door, he fainted in fear. The last thing listeners heard was someone saying, this thing has gone far enough, let's get out of here. Happy Halloween. Wait for me.